ang Panginoon ay nasa tayo. consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having an high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Amen. Let us arise and sing our opening hymn, There is Power in the Blood, hymn 281. Father in heaven, truly, O Lord, 
there is power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How we thank thee, O Lord, for how you have given us the grace and the mercies for his sacrificial blood, cleansing us from all of our sins, and even how he has resurrected on the third day, giving us the justification become sinless and pure without spot and blemish so that we can face thee O Lord approach thy holy throne of grace pleasing acceptable unto thy sight we thank you O Lord for how you have delivered us from all of our sins how you have brought us together to a fellowship with one another O Lord all for the glory of thy name for we come here before thee this afternoon's worship to worship thee O Lord giving full of our praises giving thee all the glory that is for thee for thine alone so Lord bless us this afternoon in this time of worship praising thee of all the marvelous deeds that thou hast done for us. We thank you, O Lord, for how you have delivered us from the many troubles that we have faced this week, the past week, O Lord, and how the upcoming week that will prepare us as well. And we know, O Lord, that we will be strengthened because thou art with us, that will continue to guide us, that will continue to bless us, May we forever be obedient to thy words. May we forever continue to be with thee, to abide in thy Son, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Lord, we commit this time, this afternoon of worship, even singing of hymns to praise thee of thy holy name. O Lord, we do give thanks and praise unto thee. In the wonderful name, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray through the words, through the prayer that He has taught us in this manner. Our Father, Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, 
Let him come not at all times into the holy place in the very poor or assistant, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall have a the holy living coat, and he shall have the linen breeches of his flesh, and shall be girded with the linen girdle, and with a linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments, therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall testify to the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other for And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell, and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the Lord fell to be sick shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him, and to let him go for a sin goat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of sin offering, which is for himself and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from all the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, even small, and remain in the living. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat of his Lord. And for more the mercy seat shall be sprinkled of the blood of his finger in seven Then shall he kill the goats of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat, and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place, because of the wickedness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation, that the name of the mountain may be the midst of their ancestors. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out into the altar as before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall shall take God the land of the Lord and of the land of the Lord and go it behind the horns of the altar around about. And he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times, and cleanse it, and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, and the tabernacle of the congregation, and the altar, he shall live in the live coat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live coat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities until the man not enter, and he shall let go of the goat in the wilderness. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation, and she shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave, leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh in water in the holy place, and put on his garments, and come forth, and offer his burnt offering, 
and the burnt offering of the people, and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar. And the bullock for the sin offering, and the gold for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall one carry forth without the camp, and they shall burn in the fire their skins, and their flesh, and their dung. And he that burneth them shall wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. And this shall be a statute for ever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls, and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country, or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you, to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statue forever. And the priest whom ye shall anoint, and whom ye shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's death, shall make the atonement, and shall put on the linen clothes. And, the holy garments. and he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priests, and for all the people of the congregation. And, and it shall, shall be an everlasting statute unto you, to make an atonement, atonement for the children of Israel, Israel for all their sins once a year. year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Amen. Blessed be the reading of his most holy word. In response, let us open our hymn book to hymn 291. Nothing but the blood.
Bible Fellowship. Ang magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. And we have now come once again to our memory verses. I hope you have memorized this. Three verses from Psalm 51. Let us read this once and we will try to memorize this twice. Okay, ready? Reading. Psalm 51, verses 9 to 11. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Psalm 51, scripture text reference. You just um, memorize uh, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So, start. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Let us memorize again. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Let us try to memorize these two verses first. Um, verse 9 and verse 10. So these two verses are so Psalm 51 verses 9 to 10. So let's try to memorize this twice. Ready? Start. Psalm 51 verses 9 to 10. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51, verses 9 to 10. Very good. Let us memorize once again. I think we are getting the hang of the memorization. But of course, let us not just memorize this, but let us keep this in our hearts. Okay, start. Psalm 51, verses 9 to 10. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51, verses 9 to 10. Amen. Thank the Lord for the memory verse. Um, let us look to the back for our appointments. Inside, you can see inside also is a missions report from our sister, Victor Isa. He is uh, our full-time worker of the Missions Bible Center in the Philippines. He is one of the of True Life PP Church uh, missions outreach in the Philippines. So read this and let us be edified and also be encouraged also. <clears throat> um, let us look to the back. Um, True Life PP Church uh, church camp um, 2020 next year. It will be on June 15th to 19th. So those who can join us in the church camp so let us register and we can book our flights earlier for this for those who can join hopefully some of you can join okay anyway so filipino bible fellowship e-band is every lord's day it will be at 12 30 in the afternoon we shall meet at the back of our elc and today we will have our group prayer meetings so if your group members are not here, you can, you can be absorbed to the next group. <laughs> so you can join to the other group. So hopefully we'll have a wonderful time of fellowship this afternoon in our group prayer meetings. Um, also let us pray also for all of our concerns and even thanksgiving in this prayer meeting. So, so let us now come <clears throat> And worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Let's open our hymn book to hymn 292. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness.
guys. I'm seeing the doxology. Purihin ang nagpapakana. marvelous gifts for thou art the giver of all good gifts O Lord and we have returned unto thee a portion of these blessings that thou hast imparted unto us we may you O Lord accept them as we have given them cheerfully and freely in our hearts O Lord we pray and ask thee O Lord for the blessings for this afternoon even for those of our relatives who are not here O Lord may you provide them good health wisdom and knowledge and also the strength O lord to carry on these days ahead of us O lord pray and bless each and every one who are here today O lord may you guide all of us to always call upon thy name especially when we are in trouble O lord for thou art the only one who can provide us and protect us thou art our one true and living god thou art our savior has provided us with all of these things and thank thee O lord for how you have saved us and how you have retained us unto thy fold. Provide us, O Lord, with much growth in the faith and love of thee, for thou hast loved us, O Lord, before the foundations of this world. And as we come and look unto thee and hear thy words and read thy words, O Lord, this afternoon through our brother Samuel Go, who will be our messenger for today, may you provide us with hearts, hearts that humbly will receive thy words, O Lord, and partake of thy glory. And as we receive thy words, may we be edified, may we be strengthened, may we be reproved and be corrected of all the things that we have done against thee, O Lord. And may we accept them in our hearts, have repentant and contrite hearts, O Lord, to come before thee and offer thee our lives of thee, that you will cleanse us, cleanse us and approve us of our worship this afternoon so Lord hear us of our prayers and grant us the things that thou will provide for us so Lord we bless thy holy name and we ask thee in the blessed name of Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior Amen please all be seated and ask our brother Samuel Go. he will be Preaching to us today through the scripture text, Psalm 130, verses 3 to 4. Reflections from the blood of Jesus. May I ask for this? open our Bibles to Psalm 130, Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. Please follow as I read, Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. Thank God for the reading of his holy word. Let us look to God in prayer. Our gracious, loving Father in heaven, I would like to thank thee for 
every reminder of who thou art and how holy thou art. We pray that you may forgive us for all our sins, even as we reflect, reflect on the blood of Jesus and thy requirement that we may stand before thee faultless. Pray that you may cleanse us all from all our sins, and may thy Holy Spirit be our teacher, not only to instruct us, but also to nourish us, that we may grow in the faith, that we may grow to love thee more, to enjoy thee for who thou art, and for what thou art. Please have mercy on us, teach us, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I greet you in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today's topic is on reflections, reflections on the blood of Jesus. And although in these two verses the blood of Jesus is not mentioned, but there's something we need to think. What's the connection between fearing God and forgiveness? Verse 4 tells us, but there is forgiveness with thee, right, with God. Who is the thee over there? Right? Capital L-O-R-D, verse 3. Lord, Jehovah. And then we have a capital L, but small O-R-D. Tells us that he is the sovereign ruler of the universe. Lord, or Adonai. And usually, when we think of the word forgiveness, right? we think of the word love, I love you therefore I forgive you. And what about a recipient of forgiveness? Right? We don't think of uh, to repay back or to reciprocate back with fear but with love. But over here, the Bible tells us something unusual, but there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. So God gives forgiveness, God issues forgiveness, so that God himself may be feared. But that is something unusual. But it's easier for us to understand that God may be loved when he gives forgiveness. But the, the thing over here is found in verse 3. If thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? So what is the word mark? Right, firstly, you must know what iniquity is. Right? The biblical definition for sin or iniquity or transgression is usually uh, comes from two things, two concepts. Imperfection and cross over or trespass a uh, boundary. And so we have, let me illustrate this. The vertical relationship or uh, the vertical imperfection. We miss the mark. Right? Instead of hitting God's perfect standard, we miss somewhere around here. That's one way. Right? Usually that is sin, missing the mark. The definition of sin, missing the mark. And the other thing for transgression is uh, the boundaries that God has set do not cross over or we, we cross over. And that is sin. Take for example, thou shalt not lie, we lie. And thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, we do all these things. And so these are the boundaries. God said, God prohibits but we cross over. So that's sin. And over here, the Bible tells us, if the Lord should mark iniquity. Why is the word mark? Right, mark is right, from the word keeping or guarding. How would you guard something precious? How would you keep something precious? You uh, take care. Right? You make sure that it's in a safe place. 
something that is secure, something that is not open for public viewing. Right? Otherwise, people just walk past, they can take or put inside their pocket. And that's why there's uh, that's why in the market people sell safe deposit box. Right? And this safe deposit box cannot be easily opened. Right? Cannot be easily uh, broken in. And for people to carry away, it cannot be light, it must be heavy. Otherwise people can carry and run. It wouldn't be so safe anymore. And it tells us of paying careful attention. Right? Usually when we guard God's word, we keep God's word, it tells us that we are to pay careful attention to observe the law. So over here, the object of guarding right, is actually our iniquity. What does it mean? Right? It rightly means that God if God would carefully examine us, our iniquities, so we will not stand. We cannot stand before His presence without failing. That is why Psalm is rightly understood. Right? If God should mark, should mark iniquities, right? no one can stand. No one can stand faultless in his presence. As we know in examination, it's very difficult to score full marks. It requires study, and not just overnight study, but it requires effort and sustained effort. And you need to put in effort consistently in order to improve in order to remember what you have learned weeks before or months before. And you need to do a lot of things just to get full marks if possible. And we know none of us are perfect. And that's why this verse tells us no one can stand before the presence of God by our own self, on our own. And this is to tell us something very important, which is our first point. Right? God's standard of holiness is perfect. Usually we miss this point. Right? Some of the inmates that are ministered to, they tend to be confused between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Right? New Testament, because of the incarnation of Jesus, and because he is full of grace. Right? So they say um, God's law, and there's no need to obey God's law because we are in the age of grace. But I fail to realize something. Why must Jesus come in the first place? Why, must, why is there a requirement for blood sacrifice? You know, even from the Old Testament, why must the death of an animal, a clean animal, be required for your sins? Right? It's to remind us of the seriousness of sins, seriousness of our offense to God as well as what he will do in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ will bear our sins and substitute us to pay for the penalty of our sins so when Christ come he reminds us of his perfect standard of holiness he's the same God right? God of the New Testament is the same God of the Old Testament, his standard does not change. And that is why God requires a blood sacrifice. And that is why Jesus has to come. And 
we look now to Exodus chapter 12. It's something about the Passover land. Exodus chapter 12. It tells us of an idea of redemption. Exodus chapter 12, right. verse 5 to verse 7, where basically God commands the people of Israel to take the land. And verse 5 tells us what kind of land. Your land shall be without blemish. Right. Blemish means no defects. Right. There's no uh, missing limb. There's no broken limb and cannot be blind, you know, cannot be disfigured. So it must be a perfect lamb. A male of the first year, he shall take it out from the sheep or from the goat, and he shall keep it un and he shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Right after that they are told to eat it. And what's the manner in which they shall eat? Verse eleven. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. Right? In haste means don't delay. Why right? don't keep until the next day? It is the Lord's Passover. And what's the meaning? Verse 12 For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. In other words, Instead of you being destroyed, right, the land, the right, Passover land, is destroyed in your place, on your behalf. And when we think of blood, what do we think of? We think of life. But right? it's not those blood you see in a hospital, right, already pre-packed, ready to be used for transfusion to save life we see as a lifeblood of a man. Right? In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. So the question we want to ask is, what do we understand by blood? And when Jesus became a man, is it enough for him to just bleed without dying? But the answer is no. He has to die. Right? He has to bleed and he has to die. They are not mutually exclusive. Right? One explains the other. Right? What kind of death he has to die? A bloody death. Right? A blood shedding death. And you must know something how is forgiveness obtained? God 
in all his power, if God is not a holy God, he can say, never mind. I forgive all of you and I don't I don't care about sin. I don't care about transgression. Let's all go to heaven together. If he, he said that, nobody can challenge him. Right? Nobody can overthrow him. Nobody can overpower God. But the thing is, he is holy. He is holy. That is why he requires payment for sin. And you must know what comes to your mind or what comes to our mind when we think of blood. You know, there are many ways to die. Many ways. Some people can be executed by sitting on an electric chair. And maybe after a few seconds of electric shock, they would die. Some they swallow a pill or drink a poison, drink a cup of poison, they will die. Right? Maybe an injection, they will die. And some of these methods of death doesn't require blood and are painless. Right? Some of it are painless and doesn't require shedding of blood. But God, when He provides forgiveness for you. He requires the suffering of Jesus. Right? Not just his death, but his suffering. His pain. He was bruised. Right? His heel must be bruised. Right? Genesis 3.15 His heel must be bruised by the serpent. And by his stripes are ye healed. By stripes. What are stripes? Right? He was cane or he was weak. And those days, weak is not just a plain rope, it has thorns. Thorns to rid you of your flesh. And when your flesh is ripped, right, blood will spill. In Acts chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible tells us that Jesus suffered the, the pains of death. I note the plural, the pains of death. Acts chapter 2, verse 24. Verse 22 tells us it is Jesus of Nazareth and the man approved of God among you. And verse 23 tells us his crucifixion, him being delivered by the determinate, de de determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, he hath taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Right? Pains of death, loosed from the pains of death. And so, when God forgives you, the only way is through Jesus Christ. Perfect, aton uh, perfect sacrifice for atonement. The first point you want to consider when thinking of blood is the pain that comes with it. When Jesus suffered unimaginable pain. Think of the physical pain he has to endure. Right? 
right from the beginning when he was tempted, right, 30 days and 30 nights, oh sorry, 40 days and 40 nights, and tempted. He did not eat. He suffered hunger pains. Then what else? Think of his arrest. Think of his trial. He was weak. He was smoked. Right? People punched him on his face. The crown of thorns was pushed down upon his head. It must be very painful. He must have bled. And even before his trial, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, when he cried, when he prayed three times, if it were possible, the Bible tells us right, he sweat as it were blood, drops of blood. Right, it tells us that he actually bled due to a tremendous amount of stress, mental stress, until he, he bled. And then what else? Think of his crucifixion. Crucifixion. Right? His man's history, most painful way of executing a criminal. You know, it's not a gunshot. Right? Shoot the heart or shoot the head. A few moments later, you die. Crucifixion. Not only the trial overnight, but he had to carry his cross, bearing the shame of a criminal, not for his own crimes, and then he has to be hung on the cross. Right? Nailed. The Roman soldiers nailed him to the cross. And in the crucifixion, he carries his weight, right, the nails is still there, uh, makes him bleed, liter by liter, and then he has to struggle for his breath. So much pain. And that is the physical aspect of the pain, right, before dying. Imagine hanging on the cross for many hours, at least six hours. And he bled to death. That is why there's no need for the Roman soldier to break his bones or break his leg. Right? Why were the two thieves had their legs broken? So that they cannot use their leg to support themselves to inhale, to get oxygen. And that's the cruelty of crucifixion. Struggle for breath, at the same time experience pain. It's a slow and painful death. That's why in order to speed things up, you break their legs, and then they no longer have the strength to lift themselves up to catch their breath. So the two thieves died of suffocation, but Jesus bled to death. And this is just the physical aspect of it. Let's think about the mental aspect. Before his arrest, we know that his arrest taken, uh, took place at night. But you must know something during the day. He was not sleeping. He did not have seven hours of uninterrupted sleep before his arrest. The day, he goes through the day as usual. Uh, and can you imagine the tiredness he has to go through? Right? The day may be a normal day for him, but when night time comes, he was arrested, and he was trialed overnight. Not just in one place, but a few places. Not just by the Sanhedrin Council, but by Pontius Pilate, and then one of the Herod. Then by Herod, then go back to Pontius Pilate. Then in the daytime, he was crucified. Without sleep. And can you imagine 
in your human experience, what happens when you are tired? You uh, get frustrated easier. You may get angry easier. Every minor thing will be exaggerated by you because you are tired. You can imagine the Lord Jesus Christ went through all this, keeping his cool without getting frustrated. And let's think about his mental pain, the insult that he received. John tells us he came unto his own, but his own received him not. He was rejected. And then in the trial, they make fun of him. They blindfolded him, covered his head, and then after that, smoked him and tell him, if you are truly God, right, please prove yourself by telling us which of us smoke you. And they make fun of it. And you must know something about insult. They are not insulting a fellow man. They are not insulting their friends. You know, sometimes among friends you can say, oh, never mind, because we are friends, right, don't take your jokes seriously. Sometimes in order to become friends, you fight each other. Then after that, you know each other better, and then you become friends. But this is not an insult or an infliction against your neighbor. Right? This is against your creator. You can imagine this one thing to beat your sibling. Is another thing to beat your father. Right? You beat your father, what happens? Right? Immediately you know the amount of disrespect you show to your father. And in Old Testament time, right, you fight among your brothers. Right? We didn't say anything about death penalty. But you smoke your parents, you smite your parents, and right? you will receive the death penalty because it shows the amount of rebellion there is in your heart. And that's just towards parents. And what about towards law enforcers, policemen, towards people in authority, kings, princes, presidents? How much more we ought to die? Just for the same thing, for fighting, beating. And over here, Jesus, the Creator Himself, subjected Himself to all these things. The amount of so-called majesty that was disregarded, right? pain He has to go through. Then He also suffered spiritual pain. On two things, right? On two things. First is the pain as a sin bearer for the sins of the whole world. Not just for one man's sin, but for the sin of the whole world. And number two, right? This is something the teacher of our pastor, Dr. Ku, and Reverend Kwek Swan Yu. Dr. Homer Ken, he said, right, Jesus not only suffered physical death, but also spiritual death. But what is, what is meant by spiritual death? It's not that Jesus sinned, but that Jesus was separated from God for a moment. Separated from God. To Homer Ken, that means spiritual death. Remember on the cross, what did Jesus say? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right? It doesn't mean that the Holy Trinity suffered a division at that point in time. What it means that 
God did not, God allowed him to be punished and to bear the wrath of God or bear the anger of God so that man can be saved. Spiritual pain. And that is why when you think of blood, you must also think of the pain and the suffering went through, Jesus went through for us. And ultimately, this blood leads to death. That's why in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, it's called the blood of the cross. Colossians chapter 1 verse 20 and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself to him I say whether they be things in heaven or things in earth having made peace how how did God or how did Jesus make peace for man through the blood of his cross tells us his blood defines his death ultimately led him to his death so we have unimaginable pain Now, another thing about blood is we must take note of the kind of blood, the quality of blood. <clears throat> What's so special about this blood? Is it any man's blood? Let's turn to Peter. Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. chapter 1 verses 18 and 19 here it tells us the price of redemption but it's not for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without sport. But in those days, in Old Testament time, when they offer a sacrifice, in order for the lamb to be qualified for sacrifice, the lamb must be without spot and without blemish. It tells us a few things. Right? The lamb must be perfect from birth. And then the lamb must be at least one year old. So this tells us the amount of care uh, shepherds need. Because if you are perfect from birth, it's just half the better one. You still need to preserve your perfection. That's why a shepherd's job is so important. You want to have qualified, clean animals for sacrifice, you must take care of your lambs, of your sheep. Right? Prevent them from any injury. Right? They can easily fall into a ditch and get themselves hurt. They can easily suffer broken bones. And over here we are told that the blood of Jesus right, is without spot and without blemish. And that is why it is precious. And do you know why? Because it's not blood, it's not the blood of an ordinary man. 
is a sinless blood. Not just that, it's the blood of a God man. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Here the Bible tells us, Take it therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And who is the he over there? Definitely a reference to Jesus Christ. But grammatically, the he points back to God, the church of God. Right? Church of God, God, which God had purchased with his own blood. So this tells us how precious is the blood. It's not just a sinless blood, but it has infinite worth because it's the blood of a God-man. It's not the blood of Adam before the fall. And the preciousness also gives us an idea that is unique. In man's history, there's only one. But it's not just in this generation there's only one. Sometimes our definition of uniqueness means that in this generation or in this century or millennia, there's only one. But for Jesus Christ, it's unique in the entire of man's history, in the entirety of man's history. There's only one precious blood that God requires and that God provides for the forgiveness of our sins. It's not only a sinless blood, but it's also the blood of the God-man. And that is why when he paid the penalty for sins, it's not one for one. He did not die for one person. Okay? Let's say Abel. Right? Abel is a sinner saved by grace. He did not die just for Abel. He died for the whole world. His blood is sufficient to cover the whole world, the sins of the whole world. That is why, because Jesus Christ is of infinite, uh, infinite worth. That's why the value of his blood is also of infinite worth. It's not just a sinless, ordinary man. Right? That would be one for one. But Jesus Christ is said that he is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the whole world. Sin of the whole world. So it tells us that the blood is of infinite worth. two reasons because it is sinless and it is the blood of the God man. And last thing about redemption, about forgiveness. Right? In order to forgive, let's say one person, Abel, in the whole world. In order to forgive Abel, Jesus has to die. Jesus has to suffer all these things, bear the curse of God, the wrath of God, just to pay for the penalty of our sins. And the hymn which we just sang, the last verse, or last stanza, it says, Lord, I believe we're sinners more than sands upon the ocean shore. And even if all the sinners 
in man's history were to believe in Jesus Christ. Thou hast for all a ransom paid, for all a full atonement made, for all. That shows how infinite the blood of Jesus is. He can pay for the sins of the whole world. And so there are a few things we can learn from this. A few things. The important thing is, firstly, it has to do with salvation. Salvation is free, it requires no contribution on your part, and free for your reception. Otherwise, what happens? What happens if salvation is, uh, requires works, requires your contribution? Right? It will undermine these two things. Thank you. Right? Let's say if it requires contribution. And whether donation or good works or charity, you will undermine the blood of Jesus, the pain that he has to go through, and you will also undermine God's standard of holiness. You see that? That is why it is free. It requires no contribution because God has paid in full on your behalf on uh, my behalf. You can you imagine the extent God has to go through just to obtain forgiveness for you? And that's why the psalm, the psalmist tells us, but there is forgiveness with thee, O Lord, that thou mayest be feared. And we must know the pains, the price that God paid to secure our forgiveness. And that's why it has to be free. You went through all these things, it has to be free. No contribution on our part. And no contribution at all. Otherwise, he suffered for nothing. Okay, when he, he suffered, he paid something, and then he cannot possess something. He cannot possess the thing he paid for. Because that, that object does not want to cooperate with him. Right? It doesn't make sense. Right? Jesus had to go through the cross, the pains, to obtain our forgiveness, and yet we can you know, escape out of his election, escape out of his saving hands, and land ourselves in hell. Right? It doesn't make sense. And so, the application is to fear. Right? Because God forgives, it doesn't mean that He has lowered His standard of holiness. In fact, you know, the blood of Jesus should tell us His standard is perfect. Because it's only through Him, not through our good works, not through our obedience. Yes, obedience is important, but it is after you obtain salvation. And believing in Jesus is important in the present as well as after you receive salvation. But obedience, the order of obedience comes later. So that's one of the things, God has not lowered his standard. So the application for us is to fear. The second thing is to love. Love God. Love God more. And you can pray. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. And how do you love God? You cannot be lazy. You have to work hard to know God. Not just know about God, but really to know God. Right? Remember the illustration about studying for exam to get full marks? The same kind of effort 
and discipline has to be applied in our studying of the scriptures. And the purpose is not for examination, but to know a person. And this is something fundamental churches often miss. We may know the Bible well, we may be well instructed, but our personal relationship with Jesus is not really developed. We don't really enjoy Him. And the reason why we behave ourselves is not really because we fear Him, but we fear the consequence. We fear of the shame, we fear of the embarrassment, and we fear that our salvation may be questionable. There's a difference. And one involves a personal relationship, the other doesn't involve, doesn't require a personal relationship. A personal relationship is definitely more than the consequence you face, right? With, with, with reference to the law of the land or the requirement of the Bible. Right? And you know, personal relationship involves emotions. And so when you love God, you obey Him. Or when you fear Him, or when you fear F-E-A-R, right? When you fear Him, it means that you don't want to hurt His feelings. You don't want to make Him upset. And that personal relationship, the dimension, right, already tells you something. It is more than getting in or out of heaven. It's more than that. And so it tells us how we should obey God. Yes, obedience is very important. It's the truest or surest mark of a true Christian. Right, Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Matthew 25, all tells us right, God requires obedience. Right? Who can go to heaven? He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That's obedience. But you know something about this obedience? This obedience is because you love and fear Jesus Christ. You love and fear the Lord. Another thing about, another application from the blood of Jesus is that, you know, about loving Him, about having peace with Him, enjoying peace with Him. In what sense do we lose peace? And many a times, maybe we are a little bit obsessed with our performance, right? a little bit of mistake here and there, sort of like cry over it, blame ourselves for it, or punish ourselves for it. You know, the thing about your relationship with God is that if God want, right, God want to punish you, want to reprimand you, want to scold you, He did not send Jesus to die on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. He can just scold you on the spot. But if we see the character of God, very loving, very kind. Yes, His standard of holiness is perfect. At the same time, His kindness is also perfect. You know, we may be very particular with certain things, certain standards or expectation, whether from ourselves or from the church or from a fellow friend. But the thing is, none of us, none of our expectation is more of God. And God expects perfection. Be therefore perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. At the same time, God don't, don't criticize you for every little fault. Yes, from the Bible, you read, you'll know that you have sinned. But He did not take a loud microphone and shout, Hey, you have sinned. Repent or else I curse you. No. He gives you time, He shows His kindness, He patiently builds you up. Do you know why? Because He wants you to mature. Right? Can, I, can you imagine, as a, you as an adult, 
your parents were to teach you something requires like, money for your obedience or caning for your disobedience, how would you feel as an adult? Right? The, the carrot and the rod is only good for children because they don't understand. But God wants to treat us as mature believers. That's why in, in one of the verses, it tells us, be not as a moon or mule or as a horse right? that only obey his master when he's covered with rider. You know, the horse, how people ride the horse, he must wear something and then the rider must pull, then you will move forward. God don't want to control us in that sense. He wants us to know His will and to do it on our own. You know, otherwise, it's very easy. You don't have to study the Bible. Because every, every pain you go through, immediately God comes and police you. But God wants us to study, to know Him, to love Him. And because Jesus has paid the penalty for your sins, you can go to His presence boldly, right, with love. With love. Not in a casual manner. Right? Not, not in a manner that displeases Him. but in a manner that, because you know Him, therefore, you have the confidence to enter into His presence. Because you know Him, because you know and you hold on to what He has done for you, which is the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's why you can enter boldly into His presence. And of course, the obvious part of loving God is to keep His commandments. If He loved me, keep my commandments. It's not jumping and shouting like crazy people. Right? Somehow the world has this kind of idea of worship. To them, worship is like a concert. People cheering, people jumping and shouting after their superstars, after their idols. So when the church becomes worldly, they learn from that, learn from the world and bring the worldly concert into the church setting and want everybody to jump, scream and shout and cheer at the stars, right? the human idols. But that's not what worship is. Right? Worship is fearing God. You just worship God in singing as well as obedience, obey Him. And now with this, Perfect sacrifice for atonement. How can you obey God? You can obey God without your baggage of guilt. You can obey God with freedom. Right? There is no eternal consequence if you disobey. And if you if you have sinned, you ask God for forgiveness. If you have sinned again and again, you ask God for forgiveness again and again. God will forgive you. So this is reflection of the blood of Jesus. Right? On our part, the reception of forgiveness is free. Requires no contribution. But on God's part, right, it tells us, His standard of holiness remains the same. It's perfect. And his requirement to obtain the forgiveness of your sins is nothing short of the perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the whole world. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving Father in heaven, how we need thee, O Lord, to even speak to us in a special manner that all of us can understand that apply in our own way. 
how to obey thee, how to love thee. Teach us, O oh Lord, thou knowest our relationship with thee. Many a times we are well instructed, but we are not necessarily healthy Christians because we fail to develop a personal relationship with thee on the basis of what thou hast done for us, on the basis of reading thy word with a loving interest in thy son. We pray that you may teach us to love thee and fear thee and to keep thy commandments. Bless thy people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In closing, let us sing hymn 300. Hymn 300, The Cleansing Wave. Shall we all rise? Ask the pianist to play once. Thanksgiving for thy glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.